All right, well, it's noon. Welcome everybody to the Interoperability Roundtable. First time using LinkedIn Live. Looks like folks are joining. This is pretty exciting. And Interoperability is, Interoperability Roundtable is an open forum fostering conversations around interoperability. I'm Jake Tunney, product manager at Leap Orbit, and happy to be your MC today. And we're joined actually in person by hosts David Finney and Renal Basker. Crazy. Yeah, it's pretty <laughs> awesome. All vaccinated. Um, Leap Orbit is the trusted innovation partner to many of the biggest market leading health data networks, including CRISP, Manifest Medics, Sync Health, as well as the policymakers who oversee them. We are currently working on improving the accuracy and accessibility of provider data with our product Convergent a provider directory API as a service. And Convergent also assists plans to comply with the CMS interoperability rule. And we also have um, access to our API through private beta. So you can reach out to us uh, on leaporbit.com slash private beta if you're interested in joining that. Uh, and today we are joined by Harvard Pan, Chief Technology Officer of Diameter Health. Harvard has over 20 years of experience in the management, design, research, and development of enterprise quality applications, including hands-on product development management, cross-functional program management, system architectural design, and individual contribution. Harvard possesses a track record of coordinating and leading teams to deliver innovative software solutions to Fortune 500 companies, that address the needs of the marketplace. He's passionate about finding applications of technology to make the experiences of users better and easier. So before I pass to Murnal, just a reminder that we always encourage audience interaction. So please comment your questions for the team here today uh, in the comment section on LinkedIn Live. So, all right, I think I'll pass to Murnal now and so we can begin the Q&A. Thank you, Jake. Um, Today is, is, uh, is a very exciting day for me. Um, Harvard is, is not only a, uh, uh, an expert in the industry that you know, I've gotten to know over time, but he's also a, a, a classmate of mine from uh, my Wharton uh, MBA days, uh, where him and his, his brother, <laughs> they together in, were in, in, in my class. And, uh, it, it's, it's a great pleasure to have Har uh, Harvard on the uh, interoperability roundtable. Um, Harvard uh, is, is the CTO, as, as uh, uh, Jake mentioned, of, of Diameter Health. Diameter Health is, is, is uh, solving some really interesting and important uh, problems in the, in the healthcare market. Um, and so welcome, Harvard. Thanks, Bernal. I'm glad to be here, and I can't believe how long it's been since... Uh... Well, we won't talk about those days on, on this call. <laughs> so um, I, I've been having uh, conversations with Harvard over, over the last six months or so about things that um, the folks at Diameter are, are helping solve. And, you know, with, uh, with my um, HIE, um, you know, SME hat on, um, you know, we, we have run into Diameter uh, many times over the last few years. And uh, you know, uh, and talked about the tool set that they bring to the market. Uh, one of the things that Harvard keeps talking about, um, and uh, you know, I have a little bit of understanding of that, and I'll, I'll use this opportunity to understand a little bit more, is about the difference between technical and semantic interoperability. So you know, the the, the topic of of this webinar is interoperability, but um, a lot of times we are just sort of focused on data interoperability or just you know how do we move data around between organizations a lot of that is focused on technical interoperability can we make it happen can we move data between silos and, and things like that and, and obviously we are really at the cusp of uh, changing the market uh, in, in, in you know great new ways mm -hmm. um, but semantic interoperability is something that's sort of the next frontier really thinking about can we derive information out of the data that we collect from different places and can we really take um, 
take data from different places, but also that come you know, in different formats, unstructured and, and structured all together and really make sense of it. So Harvard, I'll, I'll give the space to you to really educate us on semantic interoperability and, and what Diameter is doing and how you are helping um, overcome the semantic interoperability challenge. Yeah, thank, thanks, Brina. I think you, I mean, you said a lot uh, just in the few sentences that you did on uh, technical and semantic. I'm just gonna try and break that down a little bit. Um, I mean, technical interoperability is what most people are focused on, um, just as you mentioned, you know, it, it's figuring out what protocol you use. You know, uh, if you're transferring um, HL7v2s, maybe you're using MLLP. Um, if you're on fire, uh, maybe you use uh, RESTful APIs. Um, you know, it involves a group of the coding systems that you might use. So, you know, RxNorm for this, SNOMED for that, CPT for this, et cetera. Um, or even just what standard you use, you know, you're using HL7 v2, v3, which is CCDA, um, or, um, you know, even within v2, you might be using pipe, you know, uh, ER7 or XML. Uh, we've seen some of that lately. Um, uh, or, or, you know, fire, you use JSON, and of course, uh, v3, you use uh, XML. So that's technical. And I think everyone, just to be able to even agree to that, you know, that's been a challenge in our industry. Uh, what Dimer Health um, has done is kind of take that one step further. And we have um, this concept of semantic interoperability where it's not just about transferring data because data, as it means to you, is uh, looks very different as it means to someone else. So, you know, just a really, really quick and simple example um, is, um, you know, a, a doctor might write down the note, um, you know, acetaminophen um, or else might write Tylenol. Um, those mean the same thing. They might have the same dosage and the same strength and the same, you know, um, you know, the way that you take it. Um, but the way that it shows up in the data is fundamentally different. Now you can solve some of that with coding. Um, you can solve some of that, but it's, it's, it's fundamentally a, a very difficult problem to solve. Um, what you want at the end of semantic interoperability, you know, if something is semantically interoperable is that two people look at the same data can interpret it in the same way. Right and can see it the same 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 way, and it's not just people. You want machines to be able to do it because ultimately, a machine, you know, especially in our world today with AI and ML, you know, you want machines to understand things in exactly the same way and efficient way. So what Diamond Health has done is break that down into essentially a five step process. And that five step process we have a cool acronym for it. It's called NERDS. Um, so N E R D S. Um, so the very first step, which most people think about is just normalization, right? So in the example that I just gave you on um, uh, medication of Tylenol or acetaminophen, you just kind of normalize that to a common uh, terminology. Um, you know, we step further though, and that's E, that's enrichment. Um, what we'll do is uh, let's take a drug like Vicodin. Uh, Vicodin is actually a combination drug. It has acetaminophen and it has probably have this wrong, but I think it's oxycodone um, in it. Um, now we enrich that data. So, you know, you can code it as Vicodin or, um, you know, in the final, you know, normalized coding data set, but we'll actually have enriched metadata that will say, this is a drug that consists of these ingredients. Um, and then we'll go even further and say, well, this drug is a schedule two controlled substance um, and it's an opioid um, agonist. And so those are all things and extra information, metadata, if you will, that we add on top of that, which then allows you to do really cool things. Um, you know, we work with a lot of HIEs and, you know, we have HIEs that ask us, well, you know, we want to, we have this grant and we want to do an opioid study. How do we do that? And, you know, the way that they were doing it before was very complex queries, all the various different types of, you know, opioids that are out there. Um, once you have access to Diamond Health's, um, you know, sort of nerdified data, you just query one field. You say, hey, you know, give me all the patients that are, that have this drug um, that's an opioid agonist. And so that enriched metadata, which typically you use AI, you know, to tag data, you know, you know machines to do that, um, that, that's all part of the, um, the enrichment process. The uh, reorganization, so we'll do things like, um, you know, vaccinations, um, let's take a flu shot as an example, right? So is a flu shot a, um, is it a medication? 
Um, is it a, a procedure because someone has to actually stick it in your arm or is it an immunization, right? And depending on the system that you get the data from, you're going to see the data in those, those three places. Um, Diamond Health will actually reorganize that into the immunization section because ultimately what you care about, especially you know, nowadays with COVID vaccines, you, you care about how many doses of the vaccine that they have. You don't necessarily care about, uh, or whether they're fully vaccinated, you care about that, but you don't care about you know, uh, how much they're billing uh, for that particular medication. I mean, certain people care about that, but you know, at least for clinical data analysis. Um, the D is uh, deduplication. Um, you know, one of the challenges with interoperability is that you're getting data from multiple places. So let's say the, the spigots are all open and the data is flowing. Well, you're going to get way too much data. And we actually have, um, you know, instances of our uh, looking at the data that our customers have uh, where a patient will have 11,000 allergies on, you know, on all the documents that they have. Now, that's a lot of allergies. Sounds like David. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> that's not very useful um, to a clinician who's looking at that data or anyone who's interested in the patient's data. Um, you have to deduplicate it because um, you're going to get duplicates of that data. And so ultimately, when we deduplicate that data, you ended up with 11 allergies um, that, that the patient actually had. And so um, I think the, the amount of data that we're we're getting, especially with um, the CMS rulings and all that stuff, it's gonna expand. Um, Fire certainly is making that pipe bigger, um, but it's not making that data any cleaner and a, you know, for you to be able to understand um, you know, that this patient has 11 allergies, that semantic part of that is, 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 is a difficult proposition. And then finally, uh, S stands for summarization. Uh, summarization is um, a way to kind of present everything into a single, um, you know, narrative about the patient. So a common example of this is um, a medication list, right? So you might have a medication that's, you get a prescription for and you need to renew it on a uh, monthly or quarterly basis. Um, how that shows up in your chart is you literally have entry after entry after entry of the same medication. That is not useful for a, um, for a clinician. What they want to know at the end of the day when you have a reconciled medication list is, hey, this patient was on this drug from you know, 2016 to 2019, regardless of how many times they've been prescribed that medication. They wanna know that in 2018, that dosage went up uh, due to some other things. And then that dosage went down afterwards um, after you know, they, they resolved whatever issue that it was. So that information about that patient's history and the summarization of that is, is part of what um, Diamond Health does as a part of its summarization process. So I know I spoke a lot, uh, does that, do you have any questions about that? That 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 was incredible. Uh, so you know, from from what I am uh, deciphering from uh, from your description, uh, not, you, you're you're not just talking about um, you know one part of the semantic interoperability where you can standardize everything, normalize everything, and say, hey, here is the list. Mm -hmm. But you're also talking about turning that into um, real narrative of what it means. Do you, do you also empower or enable search um, that is human? So, <laughs> you know, like, hey, um, I, I wanna know, um, you know, uh, how many diabetic uh, patients or pre-diabetic patients I have in my, uh, in my practice or stuff like that. Like, is, is, is that something on the roadmap or something you guys are working on? Yeah, you know, I mean, we've traditionally been very much in that core kind of refinery concept, right? So, you know, Dimer Health refines that, gives you that data asset. We haven't gone into deep analytics. Uh, we don't have, um, you know, something that you can just ask questions about your data and then, you know, those questions come out. Right. Um, our customers have built those systems. Right, and, right. And, so you can feed into those right. type of systems. Okay. So it can be part of the pipeline. Uh, no, that's, that's, that's great and incredible too, right? I mean, um, I, I know you guys have your moorings in the uh, health information exchange market and, um, and I've, I've talked about this at, at, at another or, or a couple of other uh, webinars. Um, but you, you talk about collecting data from many different places, maybe across the entire state or multiple states and you say, um, Here's the data, <laughs> and you, you present it to a, 
um, to a doctor at the point of care and say, hey, we got every data on this patient. And if it is too much data, there's something called too much data and, and it's information overload. And it's, it's not insights, it's not real information the doctor can use. Right. Uh, and you have doctors in the family. <laughs> like, you, you know what that means. You know, like you got, got the two minute, five minute with the patient, like you want right. to be doing real work. Uh, and not just going through, uh, you know, 10 pages of just data. Right. Um, you, you guys are really helping solve that problem, which is, which is incredible. Yeah, and I really like the way that you put it, which is uh, data is not information. Just because you have more data doesn't mean you actually ultimately have more information about that patient, right? So it's distilling down for very specific use cases what that, 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 that's uh, how, how it's born. You mentioned we're in the HIE market, um, you know, surprisingly, or maybe not so surprisingly, we should have figured this out sooner, but, you know, the, the concept of that summarization I just talked about, it's about multiple data sources, right? So most interoperability is focused on how do you get data from point A to point B, yeah. but once you actually figure that part out and you start getting an aggregate um, data source, now you have to deal with, well, what do you do? Um, one of the markets that, you know, again, we were a little surprised, um, but really, you know, resonated with uh, the stuff that we do is actually a life insurance market. The life insurance market, if you think about it, you know, you apply for life insurance, um, they have to underwrite your policy based on the permission that you gave them to collect their medical information from a bunch of different places. Now somebody has to go through that data and actually underwrite it. And, you know, there's a vast difference between collecting all those, you know, documents pouring through them versus, you know, being able to just have a summary of that patient, you know, of, of all the information out there. So, yeah, CCDAs, right? Notoriously, you find a lot of notes in CCDAs, <laughs> like it's supposed to be structured data, at least that, that's the, that's the promise of it. But what you end up seeing is a lot of notes in there. Um, and how do you convert those words <laughs> into real data that can machines can use, you know, for underwriting or whatever purposes, but also um, in, in, even if a, a human is on the other end, uh, how do you make it concise for them to actually do their work in a meaningful way? Yeah, yeah, we, we actually, um, we're, we're starting our forays into more of the narrative it primarily. So yeah. in those cases that I just mentioned, you know, we'll present the notes like, hey, we got notes from results and procedures, just like you said, you know, people just put random notes everywhere. Um, but, you know, we, we will reorganize your notes from results and procedures and we'll move them over to the clinical note section. And so you actually have a visible part of all your notes. Um, but we're having, uh, you know, discussions with partners and such about how to then take um, that unstructured text into you know something that you know someone can review or something that's usable um, that you can structure more re uh, regularly. That, that's great. Um, so uh, I'm going to another hot button topic. Can, can I, uh, I yeah, actually? Yeah. I've been I've been kind of chomping that <laughs> I, I on, on this topic. <clears throat> so you know, obviously the the history is yet to be written on 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 this, but you know, COVID. COVID was probably more a cascade of crises than, than a single crisis. And I, I think, you know, one of them was a, was a real crisis of semantic interoperability, right? I mean, um, we, we got a little taste of this with, with lab values, right? Um, uh, people are getting tested for COVID. Mm -hmm. um, th these are new, this is a new virus with, with emerging strains of the virus. These are tests that were built on the fly and, and rolled out in, in some cases in weeks mm -hmm. um, and public health officials at, at the, you know, the local and state and federal level are, are saying, give me the data. Um, and, and I think they, they thought of it as a technical interoperability problem first and foremost, right? But um, once they started to get the data, the, the data looked like all kinds of different things because you had hospital labs sort of making decisions on the fly in a crisis about how to report these things. Mm -hmm. um, what, what did you guys learn from that experience? I mean, were you, were you pressed into service with some of this stuff and, and how do we make sure that, you know, the, the crisis doesn't metastasize the next time something like this happens? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think uh, interoperability as an industry, you know, uh, healthcare just changed so much uh, as a part of 
um, just what's happened in, uh, throughout this pandemic. Um, Dam Health specifically, we were uh, pressed in the service, if you will, um, with um, a joint uh, effort with Optum Insights and, um, and the state of California's Department of Public Health. Um, so California was dealing with a, um, you know, an influx of tests um, and, you know, they had uh, hundreds of labs throughout the uh, state that would send uh, data to the Department of Public Health. Um, you know, the semantic part that I just talked about in nor normalizing the data values was certainly a big part of the what Dimer Health played into it. Um, but I would say that the, the other part was just even the discovery of the issues, right? So, um, you know, part of what Dimer Health offers is um, this uh, data dashboard concept, actually assess the data quality of the data that's coming in. So we can actually have rules around, hey, you know, you didn't code this, this is probably a positive result or a negative result, but you indicated otherwise in this, you know? So, you know, uh, we, we had rules that we actually um, helped to develop around that time, uh, specifically around uh, the lab results that were coming in. Um, but certainly, um, you know, in terms of your second question, how do we not metastasize this into something bigger? I think the industry just has to realize that it's, you know, step one is getting the data, our uh, data, step two, is that semantic part? You you know you can't make useful analysis out of uh, you know gar garbage in garbage out, right? So um, how do we effectively solve that problem? How do we make sure that that doesn't happen to us again? Uh, involves analyzing really every step along that process because you could you know even if we fix um, the data as well as we can, there are certain things that we just can't do. You have to go back to the source for that, right? So you have to build in the processes to be able to say, hey this lab, you're not sending this field back um, properly, or, you know, H07 just, um, you know, has a new standard here and some EHRs are doing it and some aren't, um, and you need to, you know, get on board, you know, so those type of activities do need to continuously happen. That's great. Um, so uh, as I was beginning to say, uh, another hot button topic and, and it's sort of, um, you know, leads from your description of what you're doing, which is you are not just reading the data and presenting it. You are reading the data, making inferences, making essentially changes to the data um, in a way that can have a different uh, meaning than if somebody just looked at the data in, in, in its original form. So. Um, how do you, uh, and the, the term you used was provenance of data. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I know of provenance in other contexts, but I understand it here. But can you, can you talk about that and how are you solving that problem of, hey, you changed the data. Can you show to a end user or customer why and where that data came from originally so you can sort of lead them, it's not black box, right? So it's like lead them to, yeah, this is why. Yeah, yeah, no, that, that's, I mean, provenance is one of the most important things, um, you know, when you're dealing with clinical data, because you you want to make sure that you are you understand where it came from, you know, how it moved throughout the process. Uh, provenance is ultimately just the history of the data and where it came from, right? And so um, I can talk about, you know, what we, you know, pre-fire, um, so, you know, the, from the moment Dimer Health uh, started working on this concept of summarization, this concept of, um, um, you know, normalization, the nerd stuff I talked about earlier, we made sure that we didn't change the data uh, per se, right? So mm -hmm. if you take that CCDA model, which we start off with originally, and you had these codes or these values uh, for each of these clinical entries, uh, when we actually enrich, we add new fields. So we're not, we're not changing that original code or value. Okay. But even when we normalize, and so we, you, know, you would think that if you normalize something, you got to change something. What we did was we actually added new fields to capture that information. Um, not too creative with our naming, but we basically called them recode and revalue. So our, uh, if it's a status, we call it restatus. So you know, what we have ultimately in our model is um, a bunch of new fields of what Dimer Health does, but we also have all the incoming fields. And so we weren't necessarily changing that. But once we 
started summarizing, right? So, you know, you take two documents and you say, hey, this person said Tylenol, this person has acetaminophen. I'm going to deduplicate that into one entry. Now you have to explain where did this information come from, right? And we have we have provenance where we call it a source array, right? So we, for every entry in which we deduplicate or we summarized, we had a source array that would say, hey, this came from document one and this came from document two. Um, and, you know, this is the relevant information to trace back, right? So we always had that traceability back to the original document, even if you were dealing with what was effectively a brand new document that Dimer Health had created. And so, you know, some of these source arrays would be quite long. Like I said, you had 11,000 allergies. If we deduplicate that to 11 allergies, well, each of them have to say, hey, this is the entry that it came from. Um, and that, that, you know, resulted in just this single allergy. Um, so that's pre-fire, right? And, you know, you think about, well, what did Dimer Health effectively do? We, we extension, essentially added extensions on top of the CCDA model, right? And that works because, well, you know, we're, we, we're the only ones that really have to deal with our model uh, other than our customers. And we can, you know, tell our customers, this is how Dimer Health stores this data. And this is how you can get usefulness out of that. Fire, um, however, is supposed to be a standard, right? Uh, just like HL7v2 was. One of the concepts in HL7v2 that, you know, kind of presented a lot of problems was this idea that you could have Z segments, right? So, you know, Z segments were basically anything you want to put in there, you just define, <laughs> right? And it's a it's a point-to-point -point protocol. And so you end up um, with uh, party A and party B saying, hey, let's just agree that I will send you the member ID in a Z segment and it will be in the second field here, okay? Now, if you just think about that for a moment, right? That, that works between party A and party B, but once we start talking about interoperability, where you're sending data everywhere um, and somebody has to now take that HL7v2 and translate that into something that's meaningful, who the heck is gonna remember that five years ago, this party A and party B agreed that you know, Z segment the second field is 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 going to be the member ID, right? So, it it was it was a losing proposition um, from from that perspective. Um, and we, as we looked at Fire, uh, Fire incidentally has this concept of extensions as well, right? Yeah. So you could extend the model of Fire. And so, we, you know, our initial take was, well, we could just take Fire and, you know, we could store the old and new data within extensions, right? So we'll we'll basically just do the exact same thing that we did there. And as we kept thinking about it, we were like, well, we're just reintroducing the problem that HL7v2 had, right? And there's no way that anybody who reads Dimer Health's fire resources is going to know without extensive training um, that that's where they get the data. And then it was at a time we consulted with a few experts in the uh, fire community, um, and they really pointed us to, you know, not surprisingly, the provenance resource, right? So... Um, the provenance resource is interesting because um, what we can actually do now is we store the original information as it came in into one resource. We store our Dimer Health version of that into a separate resource. And then we link them together using essentially the provenance resource. And so um, it's, it's actually pretty cool. Um, allows us to essentially do exactly what we were doing um, within the recode revalues that I talked about earlier, but in a standard way. Now, um, when you ask for a resource for an observation, you can include, you know, as a part of um, a, a rev include, right? So you can say um, request this particular resource, rev include equals provenance colon target, right? And by adding that into the search parameter, it now returns you not only the original resource, but also returns you back the provenance and all the information related to it. So you kind of get the best of both worlds, but in a standard uh, kind of way. That, that's, that's brilliant. And as, as a technical guy who has to deal with standards all the time, <laughs> I, I appreciate you sharing that because <laughs> I, I, I think that can be a solution to a lot of um, other extension problems that we are facing in fire. Yeah, yeah. I, I really believe that, you know, the fire community, it's it's rich, it's broad. Um, it's fantastic. We we just have to be having these type of conversations and and move away from, you know. The easy, easy button, right? Easy button is just use a Z segment or use extensions. 
and not not think about uh, standard. But you know, when we talk about standards, and I, I'm, you know, it's, it's true that um, without extensions, you would not have a standard, right? Because people need to do their day to day job and getting stuff done. But at the same time, that that extra five minutes or ten minutes, or maybe even a day, that takes you to sort of understand where is the right place for something. Mm-hmm. Is it pays dividends in the long run. Yep. Um, changing gears a little bit here. Um, it, this is a sort of a different domain altogether, but you guys are um, uh, getting into it, and I, I just wanted to talk about this. And uh, some folks on on the on on the webinar would appreciate uh, bringing this because it, it's it's also a domain that's uh, quite relevant. Um, in the pandemic time. What is OMOP CVM? <laughs> I'm throwing another set of acronyms here. And why do we need uh, to map FIRE to OMOP? Mm-hmm. And what, what is the status of the effort? Yeah, no, great, great question. Um, I think it goes back to kind of what you were asking earlier, like, you know, can you ask questions about the data, right? Yeah. Um, and I think the the answer to that is um, sure you can. Um, you know, people do it all sorts of different ways. People build their own data warehouses, data marts, etc. Um, but sort of piggybacking on our, you know, uh, last conversation, just on, you know, standards. You know, is there a standard way to do this? I'm actually really excited because uh, HL7 International and the Observational Health Data Sciences and Informatics OH um, DSI, um, you know, had an announcement earlier this year. Um, and they basically said that they're going to collaborate on um, uh, to address the sharing and tackling of data and health by creating a single common data model. So, you know, whether that means, you know, it's going to be OMOP version seven or, you know, something else is exciting because it's literally tackling the fire to OMOP, you know, question. So, but going back to your, to, to your original question, which is what is OMOP? Uh, so CDM is common data model. But OMOP is this, um, it's, it's, a, it's a common data model that's meant for uh, analytics on observational data, right? So uh, what it has done traditionally is um, uh, you have disparate databases, right? Um, and these disparate observational databases um, will have different, uh, you know, uh, code sets, languages, et cetera. You have systems that analyze claims. You have systems that analyze clinical data. Um, and what OMOP actually does is it sort of marries those things together, right? So it has a very rich uh, model um, that they've developed um, to support analysis. What's even more exciting about um, OMOP is that uh, it's they've, they've got a lot of analytics already built up over the last few years. So if, if something is in OMOP, Um, There's a lot of open source tools, analytics tools that you can look up. They have a GitHub repo um, that you can can check out. Um, But you essentially get standard analytics tools that you can now put against an OMOP model and start answering those questions, right? So to your your point earlier about answering questions, the goal is if you get this data there, we already have so many tools that people can just stand up to answer those questions. But the challenge is how do we get the data there, right? So fire is a bunch of JSONs and how do you then map all those JSONs into an OMOP model? So there's, there's a lot of very smart people that are uh, solving that problem today. And once you uh, do that, you know, just kind of list off a few things, you know, data quality characterization, medical product safety, uh, comparative effectiveness, quality of care, patient level predictive modeling. I mean, these are all existing tools that OMOP um, or the OH uh, DSI already has developed tools to do. Um, so that's really exciting um, kind of going forward. Wow, that's, that's, uh, that's a new world for me. <laughs> um, is, is OMAP uh, expressly meant for analytics purposes? It is, it is. I mean, it's, it's, um, it's used very heavily in research. Um, so life sciences, uh, pharma industries uh, use it very heavily. Um, it hasn't seen a lot of, I would say, adoption in the provider and, and payer markets specifically. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I, I think everyone's trying to figure it out, right? So payers are starting to get or not get, but they're starting to get a lot of clinical data and they have to marry 
the claims to clinical, um, all this other stuff, and they're they're trying to figure that out. Um, but you know, you have already an existing model that's sort of married it together. I think the granularity and fidelity of that data is different than what people expect. So we have to solve those challenges because mm-hmm. you know, if you transfer everything to OMOP, you might lose uh, the fidelity of some of that data if that model doesn't support your particular use case. And so there might be resistance there. But overall, I mean, this is um, you know, getting to that standard, getting everyone there uh, should be a goal of the industry. Does the, does the clinical trials or pharma market use this, uh, the, the OMOP model? Yep, they, they, they do uh, pretty heavily. That's, that's good to know. <laughs> um, that's all the questions we had uh, um, for the discussion. Um, do we have uh, questions from the audience, Jake? I am not seeing any questions in the in the LinkedIn live event. Um, if folks who are out there have questions, feel free to drop them into the into the comment box. Um, Harvard, I, I did have a question while, while you were you were talking about um, some of this stuff. I mean, in diameter's view, where does the where does the patient sort of sit in all of this, right? I mean, we've got all of these pipes that are. Start and this may not be a CTO question. This may be a, a philosopher question, um, but I, I'm curious. To, to, I'm sure you guys talk about this. Like um, we've got all of these data pipes that are that are starting to open because of CMS rules and, and other forces in the market. Um, and uh, and I think as as consumers, we we are only beginning to wrap our heads around you know what what this means for us and to what extent we have have control of it. So um, wh- where do you all kind of sit in those types of discussions when you talk about them? Yeah, I mean, well, obviously, you know, patient is, is you know, the, the reason why we're in this industry in the first place, right? So it's, uh, they, they have to be at the center of it all. Um, I think that, um, and this is not me speaking as, you know, CTO for Dimer Health or anything, you know, where this is where, you know, Harvard Pan sits in terms of where I think the, you know, the market might be going. I think um, some of the CMS uh, rulings recently, patient access are fantastic. Um, I think it starts giving people direct access to their data in the various uh, forms that it uh, has been delivered. I think some of the efforts by, you know, some of the big tech companies, you know, Apple and Google uh, to create health records that you can download and get interact uh, with directly um, will continue. Um, I think at some point, and this is really the way that I, I think about it, right? So when I, when I got, um, when I got my, you know, smartphone uh, or iPhone back in, you know, the early, uh, late 2000s, um, and it connected to Facebook, um, Google, you know, LinkedIn, etc., and it downloaded all my contact information. I had like seven copies of my wife's number in there, right? So, you know, this is um, I had to go through at the time and manually merge people together and. You know, over the last 14 or so years, uh, we sort of solved that problem, right? It can identify basics like first name, last name, email, and, you know, a number of other connections, and it can, it can merge those records automatically. I think we're going to see a little bit of that um, as patients get um, more and more access to their data. So the nerds process I talked about, um, you know, it has to exist on whatever platform patients are getting their data on. You know, they're going to get this data. Um, they're going to get way too much of it. They're going to wonder, well, why is, why does this say this here and that there? It's sort of like getting your credit report, right? A bunch of people report on your credit to different people. And then you have to go ask a credit reporting agency to change your, um, you know, no, I actually pay myself on time. I don't know where that I, did, I, I didn't you know, do it on time. Um, some level of that is going to happen, but I think ultimately the net is the patient will have much greater visibility into their data. They're going to have much more control. Um, and they're going to be able to, you know, um, work with hopefully a rich ecosystem of applications that can then start to do something with that data, right? So not just the use cases that you and I um, in our respective companies will come up with, but, you know, there's a whole ecosystem of people out there with smart ideas. So, Well, and so, I mean, you're, most of, of what you were talking about is sort of data inbound to the patient, right? Um, but I, Last night, I got a note that my there was an update for my um, Apple Watch and was kind of flipping through the, the release notes. 
there's obviously a lot of, of, of new data that, that has the potential to get generated and, and inform, I think, the longitudinal um, clinical documentation of, of, of each of us, right? Um, are, are you all starting to, to look at any of that or, or be asked to, to deal with it and try to normalize it and make sense of it? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, if you, you, you hit right on it, you know, there's this whole, um, you know, medical devices, how much data that they're sending, um, you know, there's stuff that we don't do today that, you know, uh, social determinants of health, um, data, um, you know, there's, yeah, tons of, uh, data that, uh, is coming in. People are asking to normalize, asking to put it into the same place and, we're starting to look at it, but you know we're we're in the very early stages of it. Very cool. Um, well, yeah. Again, I, it looks like there are not questions in the in the LinkedIn. Jake, um, you wanna you wanna bring this home? Sure. We can wrap it up. Thanks so much, Harvard, for joining us today. Of course. Really enjoyed the conversation. Yeah. Thanks for now, and David, and uh, thanks everybody who was able to join via LinkedIn Live for a uh, new experiment there. I hope, uh, hope it went well. Seems like it did. Um, and thanks again, Harvard. And we will see you on the next interoperability roundtable. All right. Thank Care you, Harvard. Harvard. Have a great weekend. You too. Bye. All right. Thank you. We are wrapped up.